Do it. It's happening. All right. Ready or not, here we go. <laughs> Pulling up the notes. Corley Moore, Firehouse Vigils, Weekly Scrap, number 149. My guest this evening is Tom Hollick. He has uh, time. He started in Tennessee as a volunteer. He did his time in Tennessee, and then he said, you know what? I'm going to Texas. He's been in Texas. How long have you been in Texas? So I, I was born there, and then I've been here back home 10 and a half years. 10 and a half years, man. Yep. He just started employment with the city of Sabalo as the beginning of July as a battalion chief. He's the lead instructor for No Quit Writ with MV Fire Rescue. He's also an instructor with the First Line Cadre. He's a family man, and he loves the fire service and spends as much time as possible to reach the standard the citizens expect. Welcome, my brother, Tom Hollick, to Weekly Scrap, number 149. Thank you, Chief. I love it. I'm going to situate you here. I'm going to pull you over, and then I'm going to adjust. Something I should have already had done. There we go. Is there anything I missed in the intro? Anything you would like to add? No, sir. Audience, please get your questions ready. It's going to be a good time. Make this one big. I'm moving windows. Uh, get your questions ready. Kyle Romagus is the unofficial uh, producer of the scrap. He will field your questions. He will throw them at me. Uh, I always like to mention at the beginning right now, the vigilantes, if you're not a member of the vigilantes, man, get your, get, get in and be a part of it. Go to firehousevigilance.com, become a part of the vigilantes. We are currently reading no exceptions leadership from Jared Sergi. We're going to be discussing this book at the next forum, which is July 31st. So, uh, we're also going to talk about electric vehicle fires because the vigilante said, Hey, we need to know more about electrical vehicle fires." So that's what we're going to discuss. So it's going to be a good time. If you get a chance to do that, do it. But that's the uh, opening uh, housekeeping out of the way. Here we go. There's so much. I want to catch you up. Here we go, Tom. Michael Lataki says, I know him. <laughs> Kyle Sanchez says, let's go with four O's. No, that's six O's. <laughs> They're both out Dave, of the right now. <laughs> the man, the myth, the legend. Honored to learn from you, brother. That's from David Copland Dash Castillo. Hmm. And then we got some dad gums coming. Matt Bryant with a dad gum. Look at that guy. Yeah, dad gum. Looking forward to this all day. Going to be a great scrap. Here we go from Hayden Struble. All right, I'm trying to catch you up, but it's really hard because there's a lot of them. I'm sorry. <laughs> Michael I saw, said, good evening, gents. Great weekend at the lake. Let's get it on. Absolutely, brother. It was great to meet you in person. Again, let's go from the shop. Let's go from Kyle Sanchez. All right, there's a ton. All right, all right. I could keep reading them, but yeah. I'm going to talk to Solid. I'm telling Kyle we're solid. He asked if everything was good. Okay, here we go. Brother, I always like to send out uh, a questionnaire slash like what to expect at the scrap to the guests, and they always are amazing because I have amazing guests, and they always send back good stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, the first one you sent back is like right in something I love, and it's my wheelhouse, and I wanted to start with it, but you talk about your circle of influence yeah. and how you believe this is a topic that can make or break you in the fire service. So I just want to, I want to lead off with that and say, talk about it and go, and what does that mean to you? Yeah, hundred percent. So, uh, you know, it's a hard lesson that I learned early on and, and my mom was, was, uh, instrumental in that. So she was trying to teach me that when I was in like junior high and high school. And of course I didn't want to listen to it. Right. Powerful, powerful. Yes. Uh, so now in life where I'm at, I, I I've realized what her message was is, is it's truth. Like she was right and I was wrong and, and I a hundred percent own that. And what I've come to find out is that you, you're a product of, of who you hang out with. So if you're going to hang out with shitty firemen, you're going to be a shitty fireman. You know, nice. if, 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 you know, I, I got really lucky. So uh, I had an awesome training officer. His name was Chris Knudsen. He is now the, the fire chief for Playsto. And man, he was built to be a training officer. Like he put me on the right path starting off, like from the get go. My first writ class was in 05 when I first started. You know, and, and then everything right after that, he, he pushed me to go to smoke divers in Tennessee. He pushed me to go to FDIC, pushed me to go all these things. And he was just 100 percent built for this. And one thing that I take from him is, you know, you you are responsible to be a good fireman first. And, you know, everybody wants to dive off any of these, you know, and they're cool, like hazmat and rope rescue and all this stuff. But one thing that he always held true to was you be a good fireman first. And that's one thing that I've carried forward from him, though. Um, 
you know, you learn the good and the bad. And, and I'm, I'm lucky enough to have a really good circle of influence. I've got, you know, Kevin Fluger, one of my, one of my best buddies, man, he's, we get to hang out a lot and we just like feed off of each other, you know? Right. And, and I love that because it just, it, it, it's made me better. It pushes me to be better. You know, we force each other to be better through who you hang out with and that circle of influence. And you're right, chief, I, it, it will make or break you. It absolutely will. hundred so, percent. Yeah. So, let yeah. me ask you this, because yeah, obviously you started in Tennessee. You grew yeah. up in Texas. Started in, you started the fire service in Tennessee, mm -hmm. and then after five years, roughly, yeah. you moved back to Texas. But um, how influential has has it been for those you've hung around or or been in your inner circle, personal circle? Mm -hmm. Like, just was it was it pure luck that you got with people that were passionate? Was it intentional? Was it uh, a combination? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I always say luck. I was lucky. Uh, I don't feel like it was luck. I mean, I say it, but I really, I think what it was is God put me in the place that I needed to be. And nice. I just, it, that's the way that it ended up. You know, I ended up with a really great training officer. He sent me to some great classes now coming down here. It's funny, like how Kevin and I met, uh, you know, I called chief Ramagus and, and we were having some troubles with some, uh, some nozzle stuff at the department that I used to be with. And I was telling him over the phone, I was like, Hey man, listen, like I'm having these issues, like this wicked back pressure on this nozzle and nozzle reaction, all this stuff. And when I call or when I called him, he was like, Hey, what are you doing this weekend? I was like, what, excuse me, wait a second. <laughs> he goes, yeah, I'll just drive out there this weekend and we'll, we'll <laughs> go put some work in. And I was like, well, I just so happened to be on shift. I would love for you to come. So we turned it into this training opportunity. So I reached out to my really good friend, Captain Everett from Live Oak. And he was like, I got the guy. I'm sending him over. So he sent Kevin over. That's how we met initially. Really? You know? And yeah, it's crazy how you like all this stuff. It just it happens for the right reason at the right time. That, that's the way that it just goes. And I, I love that about it. Like, and, 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 and it makes me wonder how many people who if – the other side of the coin, they're like, yeah, I just met Tom Hollick at the right time. And he was <laughs> passionate. He was passionate. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like yeah. he was passionate about it at the right time when I needed it. Sure. And so I, I, mean, I hope so. <laughs> that, that's always the intention. I mean, right. I definitely want to be that person for somebody because that's just me paying it back to so many others that I've had the opportunity to listen to, you know, that have done that for me. I want to be that person. I don't feel like I'm that person. I don't feel like I'm ready to be it, but I mean, I hope that I'm <clears> it. <laughs> and and I, I promise you, and yeah. Kyle's in here. I promise if you ask Kyle, he's like, I'm not that person. I just, yeah. People, oh, yeah. people, people call me and ask me about nozzles. I tell them the truth. Yeah. And, <laughs> and he does. <laughs> and so a hundred percent and uh, absolutely dude, yeah. that's a, that's an awesome story. Cause you know, yeah. any, anybody who knows me knows how much I love Kyle. Yeah. All right. Pulling up my notes, getting back to him. <clears throat> uh, got lucky. I love that term that you used doing the notes. Your first training officer, he set you on a path that proved to be a very successful one. Um, I want you to dig into it if you can, if you can, and just tell yeah. me what you mean by got lucky. No, I, I'd love to. So, like I said before, uh, and again, all of it's thanks to Chris Knudsen. Uh, that dude set me out on the right path. Like I said, he, he was he, was he Tennessee or Texas? I'm just asking. Was Tennessee. Yeah. So okay. I, worked, I worked in Pigeon Forge. I was a volunteer for a year and then I worked there five years paid. Uh, and I, I, I I say I also like to say I got lucky on that deal because I was actually working for the pools in Pigeon Forge and I just happened to go to the city picnic and the fire inspector at the time, Roger Price, he comes up to me and he's like, hey, you're big. You want to volunteer? And I was like, hell yeah, let's do this. You know, uh, so I lucked into that. And then, you know, up, up there, it's it's pretty tough if you're not from there to get into the fire department. And, and I, I lucked out to get to be one of the first, you know, full time paid members with Pigeon Forge. And Chris Knudsen set me out on the right path, man. He initially, when I was a volunteer, he was he was going to teach a writ class, and he was like, "Hey, man, you want to come check this out?" I hadn't I hadn't even gone through rookie school yet. Right. He was like, "Hey, come check this out," and I was like, "Oh, man, I'm in. This is this is what I need to do." I'm right on, on, right on. So yeah, man, he set me on that path. Uh, he uh, he pushed me to go to Smoke Divers in Tennessee. I went there in 2008. And man, that, that class was freaking awesome. I loved it. It was so much fun. It challenged me to the nth degree. And, and like he pushed me to go to FDIC, you know, uh, I went, I believe it was 07 is when I went to FDIC for the first time. So that was your first exposure to the big show. Yeah. First time. Dude, that's, that's hard it to beat. Man. man, there was like 30,000 firemen there and it was just insane. Did hot classes on the first two days. And then of course all the classroom stuff and, just seeing that that place is just insane. It, it's crazy. 
<laughs> no, it is. Uh, th- this year was my first year to be exposed to it. So you have like a like a whatever fifteen year advantage on me in that regard. But it's insane. That's like, crazy. It's crazy. It's hard to it if you haven't like yeah, that's the word insane. Uh, yeah. My first time I met you, you picked me up from the airport because I was flying in. Yeah, yeah, it was great, dude. It was yeah. it was a great conversation, all that stuff. Yeah. And uh, and then we met again like a few weeks later. In Lady. fact, in the uh-huh. same area. But yes, you were taking a test. Yeah. I was. And and you were like, hey man, they're gonna ask me these questions. And we <laughs> we had to, you you were actually talking to Chief Romagus and myself. Hundred yep. percent. And I love the reason I said I'm gonna have this guy on the scrap was your, uh, not your answers. I don't know what the answers you gave to the test were, but sure. your theoretical answers, the 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 planned answers. It was a great time talking and discussing that stuff. So that was actually a questionnaire. So like I had to like it, it was for the battalion chief process for Civilo, the place that I just got hired in July. Uh, and I love that they did this. So the initial questionnaire was like 10 questions. You had a hundred, a hundred, uh, words to answer the question. And then the one that I was working on was the second and the last one before the interview. Uh, and we had 300 words and man, it couldn't have worked out at a better time. Cause I had, I had chief Corley Moore, I had Kevin sitting right next to me and I had freaking chief Romagus. And I was like, man, th- again, I say lucky, but like, God just put me in the right place again. I was like, damn, like, how can I get this wrong? It's impossible. Right on. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Dude, no, I, I love the conversation you had and yeah. it wasn't like you said, Hey, what would you answer to this? And copied it down. You were like, Hey, what do you think of this? You talked to yeah. us and said, this is what I think. What do you think? Yeah. It was, it was a beautiful conversation, man. Yeah. 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 I appreciate that. Yeah. So well, obviously, I mean, it worked out cause I'm, I'm at Civilo now, man, I'm so excited for it. I, no, I that really- was the, that was the spoiler to the end of it is like, uh, <laughs> and you got the job. That's yeah, the cool part. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm stoked about it too, man. That, uh, the Civilo is freaking, it's growing so fast, man. Right now we're three stations. Uh, it's going to be four here soon. And then five quick to follow They're you know, they're just growing at such a fast pace and, and man, I, I can't wait, man. We've got a lot of great firemen and they're young and they're hungry, hungry though. Dad. Yes. I, I, I love wait. that. Yeah. They're so hungry and I can't wait, man. They're, so they're you're moving right into the perfect, perfect, oh, yeah. uh, perfect slot for success. Oh, yeah. you see, I mean, you see the smile on my face. Yes. I mean, dude, I'm so excited. <laughs> so, how, so uh, how long ago did you get the, I mean, how long you been there or, or I just, time frame? It's, it's been, this is my second week. So I haven't even, so we had some injuries and then some folks out sick. Uh, so we had initially intended to start on the 11th with battalion chiefs. Well, rather than hiring overtime, uh, my first shift is on Thursday or Wednesday, Wednesday. So I'll actually be going on shift as a battalion chief on Wednesday for the first time. So I'm super stoked. Nice. And you yeah, still man. made time for the scrap. See, this yeah, guy knows. Heck yeah. Stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Catching it up. Couldn't agree more. Preach brother from John Velez Jr. Excited. Yes. Learned a lot from Tom while in Cali with him. Great dude. Uh-huh. Uh, Smoothbore Cartel said that hat, though. I have to agree. That's I love that. That hat. That hat though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, Kevin, our friend, Kevin Fluger, my friend and yours, sent like 14 flame emojis. <laughs> so, <laughs> Jared Blake said, no matter how long you've been on the job, training is key. As soon as you feel like you've learned it all, that's the time to hang up the helmet. And that is 100%. 100% the, the truth. truth. Yeah, man. Kyle, sent you one of the best compliments ever, he said, and you killed it. Talking about the the interview, obviously. <laughs> so, all right. Yeah. Pull, pull him back up my notes. Yeah. Maybe, if I can find him here. Here we go. <laughs> the shift in the fire service. I bumped this one up because yeah. I really, I really want to talk, especially because it seems to happen regionally. And then uh, like right now, Texas is especially South Texas is bro. the hotbed. Yes. It's insane. Talk to me. So, uh, I, I go back to kind of what you said, uh, when you did the nine L's of leadership at Seguin, right at the legacy conference, uh, you talked about culture and culture is what you're willing to accept and the things that you're not willing to accept that that that's effectively what becomes your culture and and that resonated to me because like down here we so for, for a very long time i feel like we've accepted subpar and now we're done with that man i'm telling you right now this place, we're done with it we're not we're not playing a game uh you know i always like to say like there's a train coming through you get on it or you get out of the way because we're coming and we're not stopping and you got all this stuff going on, like the the well, it was the South Texas uh, Firefighters Conference. Now it's going to be the Dad Gum Conference. Dad Gum, you know, <laughs> you know Dad Gum, right? No, you yeah. The conference. You got uh, MV Rescue. Like all these all these things that are just going on. And I, I'm telling you, man, this place is crazy. 
crazy. And now where the fire service, like when I started, I feel like there was a lot of safety consciousness, right? And not, I hate safety as a word. Uh, I think that, yes, we should try and be, you know, safe, but I, I, I use that word loosely because if you look, and I think it, I think it's Ryan Walt that likes to talk about it. He talks about look inside your gear, everything that you wear all the way down to your boots. It says you can die wearing this stuff, right? Our, our job is dangerous, mm-hmm. especially if you're doing it right. That's why. Um, hey, so, that's why it's fucking cool. <laughs> yeah, that's I'll why be honest with you. Want to do it? <laughs> yeah. But now we have so much of this information present that, like, you, I go back. Like Dennis Legear likes to talk about the uh, ignorance, and it's okay to be ignorant to a point. But once you understand this information, now you're now you're bumping up into negligence. You know, yeah, hundred percent. We have so much information that's present to us now that you have nothing but negligence going on if you're not diving into it. And, and I feel like that's kind of what our area is doing, man, uh, is we're just not accepting negligence anymore. Like we're, we're not going to play that game. Uh, there's too many opportunities. You've got so many of these, the conferences that are close, all these classes that like I said, MB rescue and a lot of other people's are put now. You don't have to travel that far. Like you want to train, come to my freaking station, bro. Like all we'll go throw ground ladders. We'll go stretch line, man. I'm in hundred percent. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like it's just, it's, uh, it's no more of that, that me, we, they, that, that's just garbage, man. Ooh, I love that's, that. That's garbage, man. We're not doing that. So it's always them first. Uh, and don't just say it, live it out. Cause if you're not living it out, you're doing it a disservice just to say it, you're just doing a disservice. So, and, and we have, it's our responsibility to go out and prepare. Like we have to train. We got to train as much as possible because we, we're not getting these, these reps that we need to get in and, I, I like to use a lot of names, but that's because I, I've had this opportunity to go and listen to all these folks. So Chief Mo Davis, I love his quote. Oh, yeah. I live by this. He likes, like, I remember sitting, it was at the third coast conference and he goes, uh, when, when the people, when the citizens of your community lay their kids to bed tonight, we are their keepers. Yes. Like that hit me like a ton of bricks. Like at that moment I was like, no, nah, okay. I get it now. Like I a hundred percent get it. And now that's what I like. My standard is set to what the citizens expect of us. Like it, I have, it's my responsibility. It's our responsibility to meet that standard. They said yes. it. There's nothing else that needs to be done. We just got to go do work and got to do it. So I love it, man. Yeah. A couple things to throw in there. One, Please. third coast conference. We were both at the same conference. We were, I, didn't, yeah. I didn't meet you then. So yeah, I found out, sure. found out later we were at the same one and I loved it. That was, that was my first exposure to Mo Davis. Yeah. Um, Oh, and man. then the second thing, my my comment of that that is why it's great. It's not because uh, we get hurt and we get injured and, and there's a chance of that. That's yeah. not the that's not my point. My point is that exists and we do it anyway. And this job is not for everyone. Agreed. There is a there is a certain uh, I don't I don't know if it's genetic or if it's buried in your DNA or I don't know which part of it makes it happen. But there are yeah. people who want to do it. Yeah, like. Like I want that chance to make a difference and, and give it to me. And so that's what I mean when I say that's why it's the greatest job on earth. So anyway, I want to be clear on that. So yeah. I talk uh, to my wife about it all the time, chief, you know, uh, I want, I want that fireman that's just a little bit off kilter in the head. That <laughs> yeah. one that's like He's just a little bit off. That's who I want showing up to my house, man. That's the dude that's going to, that's the person that's going to get stuff done. Like, Did you see the, uh, the cat? I, I, I'm a, I wish I could remember the state, but it was before the PD, it was before PD and fire got on scene, but he ran in and he drugged the kids out and then he ran back in and he got trapped on the upstairs and he jumped out with the kid. Uh-uh, I missed dude, that. You got, I, I wish I would, I, I should have, uh, someone in the cat, tell me where it was, dude, that's the cat I want on my fire department. hundred <laughs> percent. And people tried treat people tried to spin it into the fire department wasn't willing to go in and he went in. No. I'm not from what Never. I understand, he went in before they got there and was dragging people out. Yes. But it it was awesome. But he had it, is all I'm yeah. saying. Okay, oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you got me distracted. Uh <laughs> leadership. Brother, yeah. one one of my wheelhouses. I love, I love, I love leadership. And I want to hear what this means and how to play it out in the fire service to you. So again, I bring up Kev, uh, we talk a lot. So, uh, one thing that, you know, we've talked about, you know, he, he, he was on the scrap just a couple of ago. So he he says servant leadership and and I'll tell you when, when Kevin says it, he means it. 
and he lives it out. Uh, he's a hundred percent in, um, what I fully believe in that mentality. What, what I can see happening with that word at times or with any other word that like, is kind of a kitsch word like that. Right. It, it ends up being degraded to a point because people will say it and they don't live it out. And then eventually it's just like, nobody wants to hear that, you know? So I have a little bit different take on it because you could really put any act, like any verb in front of that, like maximum leadership, right? You could put intense <laughs> or, or whatever, unrestrained right. or apex leadership, like all these words. And really what I feel like it boils down to is just leadership done the right way. You know, like I, I'm huge on expectations. I, it's my job to set expectations forward. Love and, that. and, and not only like I, it's, it's my job to do that, but it's also my job to hold somebody accountable to it. And the way that I see accountability is it goes both ways. So like my fire chief's going to hold me accountable. The other battalion chiefs are going to hold me accountable. I expect my firefighters, the FAOs, everybody, the lieutenants to hold me accountable as well, because it works both ways. Um, you know, when I, I, I was a company officer for a while and, and I started really simple with these expectations. And initially it was just like, we're going to be the fastest at response times. Like that's what we're going to do. We're, we're going to put our gear on. It's 105 degrees outside in South Texas. I don't care if it's a still alarm, if it's a fire alarm, whatever, we're putting it on because that's what we have to do. That is our job. Like if you're hot, okay, we'll get it off when we can like no big deal. Um, so, you know, just setting the expectation through each call type, you know, having a plan, uh, I think that that's very important to have a plan. Don't leave things to chance. I hate that stuff. Uh, I hated it as a fireman when I was in the backseat of, we'll see when we get there. I hate that. I can't stand it. So like the, the thing that drove me nuts when I was in the backseat was we'd pull up and the officer would be like, well, whoever has the, the, the curbside or whoever has the fire on their side, that's who pull in line. I'm like, yeah, but like at three o'clock in the morning, and the smoke's like everywhere because it's humid down here and you can't even tell which house is on fire. Like, come on, man, let's, let's like, let's take some of this guesswork out of the process, you know? Nice. So, no, I love, yeah. Go ahead. No, I'm, I'm, I'm huge on uh, removing variables. Like variables. Yeah. We, we, we show up at a incident that is nothing but variables. And I think it's Dennis Laguerre's quote. that's like, we should be inserting constants where variables exist. Variables right. Yeah. And yeah. so, we are the constants. And so absolutely, man, I love that. Um, yeah. I was talking to, and, and, and you made a great point. Me and my wife were actually at dinner this evening before the scrap. And mm -hmm. she said, she said, babe, did you see the uh, FDNY picture where the guy got crushed under the SUV? Did you? Yeah. yeah. And I was like, yeah, that was a bad deal, blah, blah. And I, I made my comment or whatever about it. But then I was like, I, I started, because I made my comment, I started thinking in my head, how right. many times have I got lucky? Oh, or, yeah where I should have been the guy crushed and breaking oh, yeah. his leg and whatever, you know what I'm saying? And I was like, uh, you know, and just a little bit of that, uh, I don't know what you call it, empathy, grace, whatever you want to put on it. Yeah. And, and you got to look at it that way. Sure. 100. And so, but I, that it, but it plays out in that exact scenario. So, all right. Uh, love your mentality, chief Hollick. That's from Matt McGee. Culture. Mm -hmm is the definition of the district's outcome on the fire ground. Having the, having a them first mentality culture and everything else will fall into place. Amen. I'm catching you up. I really am. Here we go. All right. I'm checking from Kyle. Kyle is, Kyle was talking about the body cam footage that I referenced on the, uh, on the, uh, <laughs> the rescue. Yeah. So we'll put that in chat if people want to check it out. Okay. Sorry. I'm getting back to servant leadership. Oh, good. Um, how you influence from the line firefighter and beyond. Mm -hmm. Talk to me. So, I mean, first off, you, you just got to spend time together, right? I, I, I'm, I was bad at this early on my career. Uh, I, I didn't spend time with the crew. Uh, I kind of requisitioned myself to doing other things and they'd be sitting out the bay and I, I didn't get it, you know, and now a hundred percent I do, you know, uh, the, the crew that I used to work with, uh, we would, we would have dinner together. No matter if you brought your food or whatever, everybody sat down for lunch and dinner together. Uh, phones were put away unless it was like a family call or emergency. We just spent time together. Uh, and the nice thing about, it doesn't matter what position in the fire department that you're in, you can influence change from where you're at right now. hundred yes. percent. I mean, I'm proof positive of it. Um, so you got to spend time together, get to know one another's family. Uh, you know, turn this, turn the stinking TV off. 
and sit there and talk. And I found yeah. one thing, I think you mentioned it at the legacy conference, playing card games like yes. that, that will generate, that will generate a lot of conversation. So we actually started that, uh, playing phase 10. We would just sit there and play phase 10, just a little card game where you can still talk. And, and man, it, it made a world of difference in the crew. It just, it drives you together. Uh, you know, spending time, we host things at our place all the time, uh, get togethers, you know, hang out, barbecue with the families. And it's not just that, that station, it's the, the department, like everybody gets invited. And, and I feel like that goes a long way to really, uh, you know, once you know each other, then you really have that point where you care about each other. And then it just like it, everything just skyrockets because you, you have that care for one another. You're going to, you're going to give each other 110% all the time. Dude, that, that's that. what you do. Yeah. So I, I think that's the best way to kind of, to kind of do that is just, you know, be, be present, be with them and, and, and you know, have those ex- expectations have that accountability working both ways, have those standards set for one another, because if you don't, I feel like that that's a missed opportunity. No. And it's amazing. Like people are like, well, well, how important is it to play a game of spades in the evening or, or to, or to, or to toss some dice for who does dishes or, or insert whatever, but you don't realize how, what the opposite is, which is everybody buried in their phone throughout dinner, like eating. And it's like looking at whatever, whatever is not, it's not near as important as the people around you, but it, but it, but it absolutely replaces it. Yeah. I and feel then, like the worst thing to happen to the fire service is those stupid rooms of doors, man. Oh, the, co- the cubicles. Yeah. yeah. I want to go back to the freaking, the bunk, bunk room. Yes. <laughs> Dude. Hey, don't get me yeah. started because the, uh, I, ha- I have a whole like diatribe on the downfall of the American fire service. Yes. Uh, turning our firehouses into fire offices. Yeah. You know, and, no and, Oh, I think absolutely it it has 100% destroy people sit around and say, what's wrong with our recruitment? What's wrong with our retention? Yeah. What's wrong with our, how can we don't get near as many people as we did? Hey, yeah. quit asking the question and look around and said, what have we been done differently for the last 20 years? That's it. I'm telling so, you, I used right. to toss freaking toilet paper rolls to do the snore real loud. He's, yes. He's watching right now, but Matt Lovett, I'm talking about you, man. Hey, Matt Lovett <laughs> said a shift table was awesome. And, 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 Hundred yeah. percent. Matt Lovett is the guy that just made a comment. So, dude, man, I used to toss toilet paper rolls. At that dude, he'd snore so damn loud. But and I here's the deal: I wouldn't take it away because it was so awesome. I understand the importance of sleep, and I understand the importance that, sure. especially a busy house where you get four, five, six, seven times a night. I yep. understand it. Yes. But you have to understand the camaraderie. Yes. You have to understand. Agreed. Uh, all of that and. It's not what we've lost. It's what we've allowed to take its place. Yeah. Man, I, I love that. I love that, brother. I'm sorry. Okay, you got me on. You, you're really firing me up. No quit, Rit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's talk about it. So, No quit, Rit. Yeah. Where did it come from? Talk to me about how it began. Yeah, so uh, the department that I used to be with, I started there, and I was there for about six months. We made a couple fires and came out, and I was, like, looking around, like, man, this, this is bad. Like, the Rit – the RIT team consisted of like two dudes standing there with the RIT pack and the thumbs in their butt at the front yard. Mm-hmm. And I was like, holy cow, like we need to fix this. We, we need to fix this. So I got with, at the time he was a lieutenant and his name's chief, uh, Clint Williams. He's a battalion chief at that department now. And I was telling him, I was like, hey man, I really want to do something with this. So, you know, I got NFPA 1407. I pulled it up and I started going through the bullet points and Effectively, I, we went to the fire chief at the time, Chief David Covington. He was from SAFD. And I told him, I was like, hey, man, I really want to do this. I, I want to make this class. I want to I want to do something about it. And he was like, all right, he, go go forth and do good, effectively. He was like, bring me something back so we can review it. So it took me about six months, uh, built out a PowerPoint, the skills sheets, all the skill stations, a lesson plan, the whole nine. We sat down with him, and he said, all right, we're going to mandate everybody in this department from battalion chiefs down. Everybody on suppression is going to do this. Nice. And now, let me ask you, how long ago was this? Like This was back in 2000 and it would have been 12 or 13, I believe. Okay, okay. So Somewhere 10 years ago, there. roughly, a decade yeah. ago. Yeah. So, yeah. So we he, got, he gave us the okay. We, we taught it. And then we quickly realized because we're a small, smaller department that works auto aid, mutual aid with other departments, we're not going to be our own RIT team. So not that we wasted our time. It's just like, hey, we need to invest more time. 
So there's a chiefs group uh, that kind of meets up and I, I, I kind of got battalion chief and now battalion chief Clint Williams. He was like, Hey, uh, let's go to this group and let's present it and see if they'll bite off. Well, if it would have been just that department's firefighters coming in and saying, Hey, we're going to teach this. It wouldn't have gone off really well. Cause we were still kind of in that, that ball game of, you know, if you're trying to come in and tell us something like, nah, this ain't going to work. So what he came up with was, Hey, let's, uh, let's do a train the trainer. So we'll get some uh, students from each department we right. train them up, and now they're the instructors when we start rolling this out to the entirety of the area. And, man, it, it worked great. Uh, we we did our first class with the Train the Trainers, and then we just were off and running. And now we've got most of the area, uh, the whole northeast side of San Antonio, is pretty much trained up to that standard. And nice. so no quit writ, um, man, I, I'm almost tearing up because I, I'm so proud of it. Uh, Dude, you should be. Yeah, we uh, so Matt Valdez with MV Fire Rescue. Uh, I was teaching with the first line, and I was I knew that he was kind of looking for a writ class, and I was like, "Hey, man, like we've got this package, we've got this deal. Uh, I'd, I'd be interested to see what we can do here." And so he said, "Let's go." And man, we went and did our first uh, outing down in Westlaco, uh, and I'll tell you, man, it went off great. And it's not, it's not. Uh, it wasn't an easy task. It was like 105 damn degrees and they have mosquitoes down there that are like pterodactyls because it's in the valley and south. <laughs> and bro, it was it was rough, but uh, it's all due to the guys that teach, man. Uh, you know, That's Kevin awesome. Krueger's in that group, you know, Captain Everett. These guys, Hayden Struble, one of the, the newest guys that we just brought on, uh, he has this mentality about him that he's young. And he, he's learning, but we wanted to bring new people on to really, like, keep this thing going forward, right? Like, eventually, I'm not going to be – eventually, Kevin Pfluger's not going to be here. Eventually, Kevin right. is not going to be – well, we, we found it, like, important to ourselves. Like, hey, we got to bring these younger dudes in so we can really keep this thing going. Dude, set them up for – yeah. Bro, and I'm telling you, we've got two other guys from UC, Universal City, Zach, Zach Moore and Brandon Wilson. They're, they're freaking stellar dudes. These guys out of Converse, uh, Daniel Cano, Ram Cano, we've got Michael Lugo, like all these dudes, and they they put in the time. So most of those dudes, we went to a One Bad Day with uh, Basil. Basil, yeah. Holy shit, that's a badass class. Oh, 100%. Yeah, we, we had a freaking blast up there. But, you know, I went in with the intention of like, I'm going to, I'm going to learn. And, and we did trust me when I say we learned a lot from that dude, that, that dude is on another level. He is, he was up there. He's but, one of my favorite people, man. Yes. Oh dude, his mentality, just the way that he <laughs> talks, the way that like all the crazy stuff that he does, man. When he says, bruh, bruh. Yeah. Oh man. I so <laughs> much from him, But it was also a time just for us to show out too, man. When it came to scenario day, we that's were, awesome. Let's go. Let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> we're ready for this. Yes. Yeah. I love that. So, and you know, I go back to like that, that mega scrap deal that you did with Basil and, and Jim McCormick and Rob Ramirez and what Jim said about RIT, it stuck in my mind and I've actually repeated it every class since then. Uh, he said, we've been using RIT as a guise to teach the basics. And he's a hundred percent right. Because when you teach RIT, you have to throw ground ladders. You have to understand search. Like you have to understand fire. Like it really is just the basics wrapped into this package and we're just using it as a guise. And I'll, I'll t I'd love to tell you the story about FTTN too. So I went, up, I went up there for the live fire training boot camp. So when I got there, uh, it was it's six stations. So it's, it, you do two per day. And on day two, my morning was with Sandy Lassa for the writ part of the, the deal, right? And I showed up and I was like, oh yeah, this is gonna be fun. I'm gonna, I'm gonna freaking, I'm gonna kill this. I've got like all this stuff in my head, got this webbing in my pocket and all these freaking, all these tools in my, in my tool chest here. And I'm getting ready, like, we're going to do work, you know? Yes. Until you go inside there and it's so damn hot and you can't see a damn thing. And what I found quickly was why they put the basics always work on the back of their shirt. Because what I reverted back to was dirty drags basic lifts and carries and we would just wanted to get out because like you're shifting around in your gear like it's hot it's hot so i i since then we actually changed the class because of that like nice years. and then like a lot of these guys that are that are teaching this class uh with the cadre they've been to bears of the oath with shane bentley and those guys man 
and they brought a lot of stuff back that we're using. So like, we don't own anything. We, and, and, like, it's gonna be, and it's going to be, and it's going to be a dead gum. <laughs> it's nothing new. All we did is we went out and we searched out all this knowledge and then we put it together in this package. And the first place that I actually had my, my first writ experience, like as far as classes was with chief Jim Crawford up at FDIC for writ combat drills. And he had that guy, his name is Polly Capo. I don't, I'm sure he's still around. He was out of Clearwater, Florida, and he had When Things Go Bad, the training company. Dude, that that's another dude that is squared the hell away, man. Just I another learned, level? Yeah, I learned a lot from that dude. So It's really like the, the no- Dude, it sounds like you've had some serious exposure. Oh, bro, yeah. Like, I, I've gotten so lucky. The City of Pigeon Forge exposed me to a lot. The department I work for, they paid for all this stuff. Like man, FDDN, was, FDIC, clear, yeah, when things yeah. go bad. Yes, Basil. I mean, holy- yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. sorry. No, I've I've gotten very lucky to to be able to do that, and like I said, like we just don't we don't own any of this. It's really just this culmination of all these experiences that we've had, and we just like it's our fault if we just let it die with us. Right. So our intent is to continue to push it out, uh, you know, further and just keep pushing with it. We we're in the works right now with uh, McAllen Fire Department down in the valley to put on a class down there. So love it. I'm really excited about it. Yeah. I love the humility. I love the ownership. I love when you say I got lucky, which yeah. <laughs> luck is what happens when preparation meets opportunity. You sure. know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, but I got a lot of questions to throw at you coming from the audience. So I got to catch up. Yeah. Curtis Kernan down in your neck of the woods. Sure. He said, and we're going back to leadership. So I'm, 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 I'm jumping back a couple levels. Sure. When you revise or go over your expectations, do you get involvement from your crew as far as changes or adding things like, like what's your process? Yes. So initially, and, and I'll just be honest with you. So I, as a battalion chief, I had to kind of look back at like, what, what am I going to tell these guys? Cause as a company officer, I feel like there's a set. And then like, now I've got to have a different set because I don't, I don't want to run your crew. I don't want to run the lieutenant's crew. I, I I'm going to set my expectations and I expect you to run your crew. Like that's kind of how this is going to work. So, on actually on Wednesday, we're going to sit down and I've got a PowerPoint presentation. We're going to go for my expectations. Um, and the way that I kind of like to look at it is it's not all inclusive because I can't identify every thing that we might encounter. So yes, eventually we're going to encounter something. And when that happens, then I have to figure out for, for myself, like, Hey, how would I like this to go? how would you like this to go? And then that's where we're going to meet in the middle to kind of say, okay, cool. Like, this is how we're going to move forward with this. So yeah, absolutely. You would have to involve them in that. Like you can't just, it's not, it's not that, that dictatorship. Like I can't do that. That's not who I am. Like we have to talk together. We gotta, we gotta come up with a way that it's going to work for us together. So yeah, you absolutely have to involve them. Beautiful, beautiful answer. Daniel Kano, speaking of the Kano brothers, what are you doing? If anything, to adapt your leadership style to your new role as a BC. Yeah, so it's going to be interesting. And honestly, I feel like I probably don't have any answers as to that right now. I've got ideas, and there's a lot of them spinning around. A lot of theories? Head. Yeah, there's a lot of theories, man. I've, <laughs> I've got a lot going on in my head right now that are, you know, I feel like they're going to be great ideas, but they may have to be changed as we go through this whole process of figuring out what this looks like. So. Cibolo has never had battalion chiefs before. So it's a oh. new position for that department. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of learning for me. It's also going to be a lot of learning for them. I feel like it's probably going to be, you know, a year of just learning what this looks like uh, for that department. Like it's going to be important for us to be learning from each other. What works, what doesn't. Uh, you know, I always, you know, I, I say always, I'm not always reading, but I, I try and read a lot, right? Right. Uh, one of the things that I, I am definitely focused on now is that leadership side of it. You know, I've got to really adapt to that, that position because it's a new position for me. So when I, when I was a company officer, uh, I actually reached out to Basil when, when we were going through this process, when I found out I was getting a job and I told him, I said, Hey man, like I'm, I'm pretty uncomfortable right now. Like I, I feel very uncomfortable uh, because I've been comfortable for a while now as a company officer, because I could go in, I knew what my, my guys are doing. I knew that they, like, we were on a good, we were, we were on a good stride. Like we were, yes. getting, we were, we were and, getting. and if someone wasn't, you knew how to push the levers to get them there. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I had a process for like almost every, yes. Like for so many things that we encountered as a crew that we figured out how to get through it together. And 
I told him, I was like, man, I'm uncomfortable. And he was like, well, if you're uncomfortable, you're growing, growing comfortable. You ain't grown. I was like, Oh, okay. So I'm doing the right thing. (laughs) Damn (laughs) it. Basil. (laughs) You got me. (laughs) 100% man. I love it. (laughs) Another one from you, Anthony. Gianfrido, I hope I got it right. Gianfrido, do you feel a close crew circle of influence produces better firefighters and training outcomes? Hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, is he speaking specifically to like about a crew? Is that what he asked? Like if the crew is operating at that level? Uh, what What he said, and I can ask for clarification over in the in the comments. But he said, do you feel a close crew circle of influence produces better firefighters and training outcomes? Yeah. So, so I'm assuming yes. Crew crew based. Yes. Yeah, so I'll, I'll speak to the crew side. So uh, I feel as if it's up to the, the company officer sets the tone. And in the absence of that happening, somebody else has to has to step into that. So uh, if you have somebody on that shift, and I'll just be honest with you. I mean, I was a firefighter, and I didn't have that going on. So for me, I would just go out in the bay and start doing stuff. And eventually what would happen is the other firemen would come out, we'd be training together. And then the driver would come out, we'd be all doing the same thing. And then that company officer would come out and now it's like, we made it a game. Like we're going to, we're going to compete against each other. Yes. And once we got to that point, then it's like, Hey, what are we doing next shit? Okay. Let's throw ground ladders. Hey, we haven't done that in a while. Well, let's stretch a line. You know, uh, if you have a crew that's really just, that's has that mentality, we're going to get out there and we're going to do something. Uh, I got, I got thrown a new crew a while back, uh, a couple years ago. And initially when we started, I was like, oh, you know, we're going to pull lines every day. We're, we're going to do this every day until we, we, if, if we mess up, we'll figure out how to get through it. Like you're never going to get it perfect because honestly, I, I don't think you can always get it perfect. So I almost would rather like you fail so that we can figure out what the failure looks like and how to get past that failure. Nice. So, uh, you know, we would go out there and we do that. And if we got it wrong, we'd fix it. And then we load it back up and we do it again. You know? Right. And then, you know, we really just kind of stuck to those big five, like the search, you know, we stuck to line deployments, flow and move, forcible entry and, and ground ladders. Like that was our, that was our mantra. We were there on, the, on that, those big five. I, and I feel like if you get really good at those five things, like you've got probably 90 something ish percent of the fire ground figured out. At Brother, least if you, that. if you take those off the table as variables, yeah. holy yeah. crap. Yeah. How yeah. much, how many, how much hard and charging and how much changing con- Yeah. Can yeah. you handle? So, I mean, for the, to, to answer his question, I mean, yes, it's very important that the crew is on that same page and, and I don't think it, it depends on, on one person or the other. I feel like it's, everybody has to be in there and you can force that hand to a degree. Like as a company officer, I, it sounds really, it sounds rough, but like there's that saying, you can lead a horse to dr- water, but you can't make a drink. Well, I can drown that bastard though. And, and trust me when I say <laughs> I will, like I'll, I'll drown him. You know, that that's my intention. I want you to drown that. And for me, like I, I have to reach out to others to make sure that I'm doing the right thing. So that's where you have those other people that are your mentors, that are your accountability keepers, like the Kevin Flugers and, and Manny Barajas and Matt Valdez, like all these dudes that just like, I reach out to them to like, Hey, is this, is, is this cool? Like, what are you guys doing? Like, what do you see? So reach out to those other folks in your area. Like look out, look out for those guys that are, that are pushing, that are getting stuff done. And those are the ones that you want to stick with. Cause again, it goes back to that circle of influence. Like you become who you hang out with. So, mm-hmm. so find those people, find them. Cause they're out uh, there. Trust me, anywhere in the U S they're there. I love the tie back to the just circle of influence. And I really love, I'm, I may make a t-shirt that says I'll drown you in the basics. <laughs> you don't have to drink it, but I'll drown you in I'll the basics. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, here we come from Kevin Fluger. Let's mm-hmm. talk standards. Let's do it. We're expected to do a lot. What's your opinion on what our skill set should be on all skill sets across the board? Yeah. So that's a great question. Uh, you know, I, Again, I go back to what the training officer, Chris Knudsen, said. You know, uh, first things first, we're good at fire. It says fire on the side of our trucks. Right on, dude. You know, Preach. So don't, don't worry about all those specialty things. Don't worry about rope rescue. Don't worry about hazmat. Don't worry about all that. Let's get good at this first because that's what the citizens expect. But when you break that fire thing, like the fire thing, when you break it out, like we, we talked about the big five, but like you can go ham on any single one of those topics, right? Uh, 
I think Manny and I were talking, Manny Barajas and I were talking the other day. Manny the Barbarian. Yeah, Manny the Barbarian. Yeah, man. 100%. Yeah. And, you know, his I, his outtake on it is you be really good at one and, and you know, be be awesome be awesome at one and be be good at the rest of them. And I, I, I'm with that. I get that. And okay. my, my mentality, though, and my intention is I'm going to be awesome at everything that I possibly can. Like, I, I want to be great at, at throwing that ground line. I want to be great at deploying this line. I want to be great at flowing move because that's worst case scenario when we break through that threshold. Like, I want to be good at this because that's what the citizens expect. I, I don't like, you know, we don't have, so for departments, Kevin's size, my size, we don't have that ability to have a truck crew and we've got an engine crew and these guys do search and ventilation and these guys do, you know, they do the hose stuff. No, and that's what I say is that's the American Fire Service. Like it you represent, awesome. yes. Like the, like there. I don't. I, I would love to. I, I probably should do some research and figure out what the percentage is of people who actually have like legitimate truck companies. Yeah, yeah. And I would bet it's around fifteen percent or something. I would love to get at that point. I, and, and in fact, you know, Cibolo, the fire chief there, Mario Troncoso, is making that push to to start utilizing our aerials as truck companies, and I love that because. When we get to that point, I feel like, yeah, now you get really good at search. You get really good at, you know, roof work and all that kind of right. stuff. The truck, And then your engine guys can specifically focus on this deal. But that's just not the reality where we're at. right? For now. everybody else in America. Yes. The 85%. Yeah, we are the American Fire Service. Go so, ahead. Sorry. That's go, my. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I go <laughs> back to, you know, what the citizen, like, go back to Chief Mo Davis. Like, go back to what he said about what the citizens expect. And that's that level that we always got to be pushing for. I'm not there. I'm not there on everything. And, and my intent, though, is to get there on everything. That's always the mentality. Always. Nice. All right, I'm throwing Christopher Snow at you. He says, what are some solid RIT drills you can offer to the three-man engine company with little to no props? Yeah. Uh, so first things first is get good at the RIT bag. Like, that. that is your friend. You know, get good at that start out where you're no gloves, you know, just station wear, like just, just mess with the rip pack, make the connections, uh, you know, make that UAC, do a mass changeover, do the MMR changeover, do all this stuff and then start making it more difficult. Throw your gear on, throw gloves on, you know, once you do that, now we got to start getting, taking that vision away, then stress yourself, you know, go ahead and do a workout and then do it and see what it looks like. Uh, I, you know, getting great. And I always, Like, there's a lot of people that want to talk about how, you know, the Pittsburgh drill, the uh, Denver drill, the Nance drill, all these things, they're not good because you're never going to meet this, this specific skill set. I would challenge that with, yeah, you probably are. It might not be that exact one, but if you do go in and you have to do an out the window rescue, well, guess what that Denver drill sets you up for? It sets you up for Right. If you have to go through a confined space, guess what? The Pittsburgh drill sets you up for that. You know, like it sets you up for moving a down fireman through this confined space. Yes. I mean, we, we have to, to get to a point where we're doing that. So I love those drills. Uh, I think they're important. Uh, I, I would focus in on first though, those basics, get good with the rip pack, get comfortable with your air pack because rip and, and survival go hand in hand. You know, yes. If, if if we can if we can keep ourselves out of a situation that we don't have to call for it, why not do it? So train yourself to to start working towards that. So get comfortable in your air pack, understand the system, understand the failures you can have with it, and then work, work through those failures that you can have with it as well. Like in your head, go put your air pack on and, and work through them. I it's weird. So we actually have a station in our RIT class that we teach people how to take a, uh, an air pack off your back and then put it back on. Like, it sounds weird. And I even tell the students, like, this is going to be really basic, uh, but we do it. And it makes a world of difference because most people don't understand. And a lot of people don't even take their air pack off the same way every time. Nice. Which is, that blew I, didn't think, I didn't think about that, but you're right. Yeah. So I was very lucky. You know, in my rookie school, we had a bunch of the Tennessee smoke diver instructor cadre. And from 2005, I was taught how to take my rip, how to take my air pack off, and I've done it the same way all the way up till now. I've never thought about that, but that's amazing. That the fact that I've never thought about doffing, yeah, just as a skill. Yeah. yeah, it's weird, but if you do it the same way every time, 
if you come up to that like a wall you know a, a sheetrock wall breach like probably like 0.0001% chance that you're gonna have to do that. But if you do, and you don't take your pack off the same way every time, you're probably not gonna succeed at it. Right, so no. One cause... thing that we can take out of that, like I don't, you don't even have to think about it. Like just build all those skill sets together to where you can take, like we talked about, you can take away those variables and insert the constants because then we don't have to worry about it. Yeah, something you don't have to think about. 100%. Yep. Take them off the table. Yep. Kyle Sanchez wants to know, what are things we can improve on? And you just touched on it. But what are things we can improve on when it comes to active writ? Yeah. So uh, one thing that I've definitely noticed, and I know that you know during the mega scrap, I listened to you know Jim McCormick, and I love his outtake on it. I respect that man very highly. Uh, I think that he's got a lot of stuff figured out. For us, because we are so limited in manpower, I think that proactive writ, like what Basil talks about, like throwing those ground ladders if they're up on two, like get them thrown. If they're operating on Charlie on two, let's go ahead and throw that ladder back there. Let's soften that structure. Uh, you know, I, I res- like I said, I respect Jim and, and I listened to him and he was like, we've got these guys doing all this stuff. I, I, what I'm not preaching is like, don't go so far off in the weeds that you can't respond quickly because it's all about time. Like right. we have to be there quickly and we have to do it effectively. Um, but I think that's something that we can do better as, uh, you know, as the fire service is be more, a little bit more proactive with it. Don't just set that rip pack down in the front yard, insert your thumb in your butt and sit and wait. Another thing for that rip crew <clears throat> here, I feel like you're that extra set of ears, like listen to the maydays. How long does it take for sometimes for command to actually hear it? And I think some of that's psychological because they don't want to. Oh, yeah. Also, some of it is they, they, they've got so much else going on. So mm-hmm. as the RIT crew leader, like you can be standing there, you can have your radio cranked to the nine and be listening because and be ready for it. And be Ooh, like understanding that. that when it comes through, okay, it's time to do work. Or, you know, tell command and then we'll go to work. I like that. And I, I say I like that selfishly because – it's hard to argue numbers. You know, when the data comes out, it's hard to argue numbers. And how many maydays are missed? I'm, I'm, I'm a stand in the front yard kind of BC uh, instant, instant commander. You know, Amen. I'm not a buggy guy. And so, when, when, but, but when the numbers come out, it's really hard to argue with the number of missed maydays. Sure. When, when you're standing in the front yard. So yeah. that's why I really like what you said about uh, the hey, let them catch it. Yeah. I, I don't know if that's the right way to say it. Uh, Adam James Mills wants to know. Um, and so this is, we're getting into the hypothetical as you, as you enter into a new position. So again, I don't want to put you on the spot because you're in a new position, Yeah, it's all good. but, uh, how would you talk to a new captain that hasn't had that talk with his shift in four months and just sits in the office? So I'll rephrase it and say, if you're the BC now, cause that's your new position, you got a company officer that. Has not set expectations. With yeah, I'll Go be ahead. honest with you. So first things first, like the expectations are going to be set. We're going to train. Like, and not only are we going to train, I'm going to be training with you. Like, I'm I'm going to be sweating out there in my turnout gear with you. Like that, that's what's going to happen. So, you know, honestly, I don't feel like for for me, there's not going to be that option because I'm going to hold them accountable. Like, if if they are doing that though, and I I understand that because I've been there. But like I kind of talked about before, if they're doing that, that doesn't set the tone for you though, you know, go out there and start training because it is contagious. Like when you start having fun and doing stuff and other crew members start joining in, like they have really no option. They, they could stay in there, but they're going to, they're the ones that are going to miss out, not you. So, uh, speaking specifically for me though, I, I'll just be honest with you. They're not going to have that. That's not even an option. It's not going to be an option because the expectation is that we are going to train. We, you know, we're on a 48 hour shift. Uh, I do uh, put a high precedence on EMS because it is a large point of our call volume. So for us, uh, one of my expectations is that we're going to train on day one, specifically fire. We're going to pick out of those big five. That's what we're going to do. And then on top of that, I expect that a line is going to be deployed uh, at least once per on the first day. You will deploy at least one line. And then on day two, we will focus on EMS. So that, that's my expectation. Now I'm going to hold them accountable. They're going to hold me accountable. 
it's not going to be all three stations getting together all the time. So I, I foresee it. And again, going back to the theory, I foresee it is I'll just rotate between stations as, as I can. And you know, that that's the way it's going to go down. So um, for me, there's just not going to be that option that we're going to have somebody like that. I like it. Yeah. Hey, and honestly, if there is somebody like that, it's because the expectation hasn't been set. Agreed. Yeah. And so once you said it, I think I, I really do believe that once you said it, it goes away. So it's a, the hypothetical goes away, if that yeah, makes sense. I agree. Um, Michael Lataki wants to know, who's been your biggest influence slash mentor in the fire service? <sighs> you know, I, I think as you go through your, your career, uh, you have different stages that you go through. So, like, early on, it was Chris Knutson. He, he was the one that set the tone. He sent you to FDIC, FDTN? All, no, he sent me to FDIC, Smoke Divers Tennessee, and – a couple other stuff that like we did in the which house. led to you. Yeah. Going to the yeah. others. Okay. Yeah. So, and then, you know, so he was the early on side as my career is morphed now and, and where I'm at now, I would definitely say Kevin Fluger is that person for me. Oh, uh, wow. Okay. He, he is that, that mentor. And, and I feel like it's a two way street. I, you know, I feel like it's, I'm listening to him. So he's doing a lot of like crazy stuff over at live Oak and it's not just him. Like, everybody at live oak is bought off into it right and it's amazing to see and that's a lot of what i want to model for Cibolo. i feel like Cibolo is going to be one of the go-to premier departments nice. in the area and i know that the other battalion chiefs are of that same mindset so i feel like we can't fail right uh, but uh, as your career morphs i feel like you probably go through different stages like i know lataki fairly well um, I, I feel like early on in your career, you probably had somebody, in fact, I think you've mentioned it before, uh, that was influential. And I, I, I would say probably for him now, it's probably somebody inside Libo. And, you know, just venturing to guess, it's probably the Kevin Fluger or the Captain Everett. Like, those two dudes got it and they got it going on, man. Like, they're, they're getting it. So nice. I just feel like it morphs as, as you go through your career. You good for more questions? I got a ton of them coming at you. Okay. So, go. Caleb, Daniel Smith wants to know, and I love this question. I want to hear what your take is. What's the biggest killer of a department's morale slash culture? Yeah. That's, uh, a, t- that's a very broad that's question. That's a like, broad one. And what's up, Caleb? So that dude is, he's second to none. And I, I love that dude very much. We've never met in person, um, but he's gone through Tennessee Smoke Divers. I reached out to him. He actually sent me some stickers and a rocker for my weight vest. Nice. Uh, out of the blue, man, just sent it to me. And I was like, hey, man, let me pay for it. He was like, nah, I got you. Uh, but to the morale question, I would say, uh, again, I, I go back to those expectations and the accountability. If, if somebody's setting expectations but not holding them accountable, especially in a position uh, of VC or company officer, like if they're not holding them accountable to those expectations, that's a huge morale killer uh, because the ones that are doing it, they're still going to continue to do it. But I would say that at points it pro- they probably look back and they're like, Hey, wait a second. Like, this is kind of horse crap. Like, you know, I, again, they're the, the ones that are still, that are still doing it, they're going to continue. Uh, but I would say if, if you're setting expectations and not holding people accountable, I feel like to me that that's a big morale killer. Dude, I love it. And I will say this. I want to, I want to tack on to it, mm-hmm. which is if you, if, and, and believe me, every time I travel, someone comes up to me and says, I have low morale in my department and blah. I, w- I want to make a difference and there's low morale, blah. Yep. If there is low morale in your department, 99 out, out of a hundred, 99 times out of a hundred, it is because there is no expectation in your department that people can meet. Boom. And yeah. so, and then, the other 1% is when there is an expectation, but people aren't held accountable to it. Yes, but it is, it is it is ultimately that someone has not said, this is how to be excellent. Because I firmly believe this, and I think Tom will agree, True. that yeah. most people want to be excellent at what they do. Yes. They just need to be told how to do that. Okay, sorry. I agree with that, Chief. You're 100% right. Like, if I had I not had those those people early on, like the Chris Knutsons, and there was other too, you know, Eric Kresge, Andy Latham, all these dudes that, like, like showed me how to be good at this job, I wouldn't be where I am now. And it, it's all due to them. It is. You know, I, I, you have to pay that. Pay they that set an for expectation it. for you, and you were allowed to meet it. Yes. Not yeah. only meet it, but then, like, fucking knock out the <laughs> part. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, 
All right, Jacob Hillhouse said, as a newly appointment battalion chief, what do you envision a typical day looking like? And how can you affect culture at the battalion level? I, yeah. Dude, I love this question. Yeah, so he's actually one of the lieutenants at Cibolo, And okay. that, that dude's smart as all get out. Uh, he's fairly early on in his career, but he's part of the he, – he was like – he is one of my second hands for that no-quit writ. And he, he was instrumental in, uh, you know, a lot of the background stuff. Uh, he really kind of just kind of took care of that so I could focus on the class. And uh, he's he's also instructing with the first line as well, man. That dude, he's got it figured out. Um, but to to his question, uh, a typical day to me looks like uh, first off, you have to start with communication aspect. Like even with those stations, like we're gonna have to talk together, figure out what the day looks like, uh, and then even if call volume says that you can't do training, bro, we're there forty eight hours. Like we'll find time, even if it's seven o'clock at night, eight o'clock at night, we're gonna do it. Like. It just is what it is. If it's hot outside, I'm sorry for your luck, but you signed up for this stuff. Like nobody recruited you. You didn't get a signing bonus. Let's get to work, you know? Uh, so at some point in time, we're going to do training. Uh, obviously, you know, with, with this, uh, this department, we, we have a lot of work to do with uh, SOPs. So they're outdated. We have a lot of work to do. There's going to be some administrative work. We don't have an assistant chief. So a lot of that work is going to be put on the battalion chiefs to, to kind of to get that going. Absolutely. I'm okay with that, though, because that's a challenge that, like, I'm ready for. Like, I'm so excited for because now we get a chance to set that tone for the department. Uh, you know, and with, with, the, with the chief that we have, Mario Traposo, man, that dude, I, he is a fireman's chief. He's all about, like, hey, I gave you a job to do. Like, get it done. So, uh, but, yeah, I, I, it's going to include training. It's going to include time to hang out together at dinner uh it's going to include time to hang out so that you know we get to know one another too and you know with three stations again i, I feel like it's just going to necessitate me ro rotating through to go eat dinner and, and sit down and be present and be part of of the team like we have Preach. to do that so um yeah that that's kind of what it looks like to me again it's theory at this point but uh i i definitely i think that it's very important so i plan on living it out and I think the cool thing about your theory is that a lot of people before you and uh, uh, in a lot of other fields and beyond the fire service have proven that what you're talking about works. Mm. So Cibola is in for a, yeah. Uh, yeah, a golden age. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Now they're already so, doing it, man. They're already and doing I love the, what you said about SOPs, SOGs. 100%. Yeah. The cool thing is like right now, me and another battalion chief are right now rewriting our SOPs and our SOGs yeah. on fire attack. Yeah. Because they're outdated. We borrowed yep. them from another department. We sure. implemented them. Thank God we have them now because th th this literally happened in 2018. And, uh, but now we're rewriting them and updating them. And yeah. here's, here's the, like the, the, just to hijack this whole conversation, but the, the, what you have to balance is the company officer slash right out, whatever it is that does not stay plugged in and does not understand tactics versus completely constraining the person that is plugged in and understand what's going on and can make a decision. So how do you provide the freedom <laughs> while you give the people that are not going to do the work out, you know, on their own? Yeah. It, it's a, it's a delicate or not even delicate. It is a, uh, it's something you got to juggle. Yeah. And so anybody who wants to have this, in fact, I'll make it a mega scrap if people can figure out who the best people to bring on for the mega scrap is to talk about writing SOPs and SOGs that meet those criteria. So I'll throw that out there Rhyme right on. here in the middle of Tom Hollick's Rhyme scrap. Be in the mix. I feel like they got it going <laughs> on, man. I've been reading through some of theirs already. Which he, ones? Uh, Say it again. Ryan Waltz. Oh, He's yeah. County. Bro. Oh, yeah. I've been reading through some of their uh, Chief Romagus sent them to me. They're they're pretty damn good. Dude, if I'm, I'm a huge fan of uh, Howard and Kyle. Whenever people bring up calves and Bro. it's like <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the best answers ever. All right, <laughs> I want to catch you up. Ryan Nasir said, "Can we talk smoke divers? Okay. How have the Tennessee smoke divers influenced your career? Was it a turning point for you? Yes, no, maybe so." Yeah, so uh, Tennessee Smoke Divers is, uh, so they did model after Georgia, but obviously they're completely set apart from Georgia. So like Georgia, Oklahoma, Indiana are all tagged in together. You got Florida, you got some other ones. Tennessee is definitely off on its own. 
Uh, it's in the middle of nowhere, Tennessee, man. It's out. Of, it's in the the fire academy, the state fire academy at Bellbuckle, Tennessee, dude. Okay. Middle of nowhere. <laughs> uh, and when I went there, uh, it was definitely a turning point in my career. Uh, it made me realize very quickly that the physical standard you have to hold yourself to is very high. Uh, you know, the first thing that we did, we went in. And, and did the you know instructor introductions and you already have your bunker gear laid out and like you we were in 22 16 bottles back then and they were like all right go bunk out and it's a mile run on air if you come back off air like see you good luck thanks for coming you know uh so there's just a lot of stuff that i took from there that has uh has definitely influenced my career it made me very comfortable in my air pack uh, cause you just have to be like all this, all the stuff they put you through, uh, you, you have to be comfortable in that air pack. And yeah, I, I loved it. I, I don't think it's for everybody. I'll just be honest with you. I wish, I wish that we had the ability to put every firefighter through a smoke divers program. Um, but I, I just don't think that that's possible. Uh, right. Right. It, it's, it's a different mentality to go there. Uh, no matter what program, I mean, I, it's tough and it, it's awesome. Like I was 20, I think I was like 25 at the time and I prepped for like six months, just getting ready. Right. Actually, so they have a cafeteria there. I actually took my own food because I didn't want to eat cafeteria food. Cause I was like, I'm concerned with how this would go throughout right. this whole week of getting my butt kicked, you know? So I actually packed my own food. They have a little fridge in the room that you stay in, in the dorm. And I had a huge ice chest, like, it was, it was nuts. And, uh, I remember leaving there and I was with a good friend of mine, uh, Kevin or Kevin, uh, Nunn, and we're driving back on I 40 to pigeon forge. And I'm just looking out the window and I turned to him and I was like, how do you explain this to anybody? Like, how do you explain it? And he was like, well, if you, if they haven't been through it, there's no way. Like you right. just can't, you can't explain what you just went through on that week of just getting your, your butt handed to you. Um, but yeah, it, it definitely, it made me realize physically the place that you need to stay i've not always met it i'll be honest with you um but you know i i realized it and now the accountability side of that is you know i i'm i'm doing it like i'm i'm working out uh all a lot uh i'm holding myself to that standard you know so uh yeah it was very influential in my career and continues to be so uh there's a lot of stuff that we put into that writ class that you know came from smoke divers Nice. Uh, so a lot of the, some of the drills that we did, uh, that we, that I put in place there, it's from there. So yeah, it was cool. Highly nice. suggested for anybody that, that has the, the gumption to go do it. Uh, I love, uh, I actually talked to Basil about it while he was at one bad day there in Buda when he came down and I love his outtake on it. Like you shouldn't have to prep for smoke divers. You should always be physically ready to go through it, but that, that's basil man that dude's always ready like <laughs> <laughs> there is no doubt yeah, that dude man, is you could be at the middle of a conference he's like hey i gotta go bro i gotta get my workout in bro yeah <laughs> so, that dude's nuts but yeah no he is yeah. I, dude i love it like i said he's one of my favorite people i feel like some of it too is like so for smoke divers if you have that physical aspect taken care of it takes you longer to get to the mental aspect so what i mean is like if if, if you're physically capable you don't have to dive into the mind to tell you, Hey, you can keep going as early. So if you have the ability to cardiovascular wise to, to go through all this, all these drills, well, then I'm not having to dive into my mind and say, Hey, you got this. You can do this. Let your, you know, your mind's going to push your body. But eventually trust me when I say in any smoke divers program, you're going to get into that mental aspect. So it's, it's really twofold. You got to have that, 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 uh, physical, and the mental aspect on lock before you, before you do it. And completely separate from the smoke divers, which I have nothing but massive yep. respect for. Yep. Like from, uh, I talked to David Rhodes and Don Sapp and, yeah, and, and Georgia, which yeah. is the one. And then we, we had our own recent at more fire. One of our guys went and passed and the yeah. Georgia smoke diver 1175, I believe, but That's don't quote me on that, but not the point. The point is, is man, the mental side of it. it you have to stress people, physically and you stress them mentally of course but then you make them make decisions yes you know and that's the part where it really matters like the other part you know whatever but yeah. once they're every like 
raw nerve is on edge. Mm -hmm. And my buddy, Michael, he was like telling me, he's like, have you ever been the, where you're working on a project, like an engine or a motor or something. And like, every time something goes wrong, you want to throw the, the, the wrench against the wall. Yeah. Like you get to that point where just like, Argh! he's like, it's that way the whole time. Yeah. And can you, can you handle it? You know, yeah. that's, all and that's what they push you. And then, and then not only can you handle it, but can you make decisions? Yeah, exactly. You know? And so, when he when he explained it to me that way, I really understood because I'm good at throwing wrenches against a wall. <laughs> uh, Matt Bryan, yeah. you asked a you asked a question. I really didn't understand the question, so if you clarify it, I will I will throw it at Tom. Um, so just clarify the question a little bit about 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 variables. Throwing it up, and I'm saying Casey Pelois said, "What is the biggest change that you would like to see to improve the service?" I mean, dude, there's a, hmm. there's right down the middle pipe. Yeah, that that's a tough one. Uh, you know, change. I think that, I don't know. I think it's going to be tough to say, and sometimes I feel like it's tough to hear, but it's also important at times just to take the gloves off. We have to get to a point where we are not just um, bringing people into departments that don't meet those standards, and I think that's also to the department's like we have to set a standard physically uh, that that we're not going to accept subpar. Like you've got to you've got to come in ready to rock. Uh, I think that some of our standards have slipped across the board. And I just looking across the U.S. I mean, it it's something that it's tough to talk about. It's a tough conversation, but I'm okay with having those tough conversations. Like uh, we have to we have to get away from that. We have yes. to stop uh, just. Hey, you're, you're, you know, one, two on the list, but you know, we didn't really have a hard physical test. So right. we'll come on in. Um, we got to get away from this, this, uh, just that mentality of it's, it's okay. Cause we can get you there. No, it, it took a long time to get to the point where they're at, if they're not cap physically capable and it takes a long time to get back to the point where you're physically capable. So this job is hard and the citizens expect that we're going to get the job done. So that, that would be the biggest change that I would love to see. And I, I would love to understand what that looks like. Cause I honestly, I don't have the answer other than right. setting a tougher standard for the physical part of the test. Like don't, don't shy away from whatever your test is. Don't shy away from making it tougher. Cause this job ain't nice. And I will caveat this next question with anything you're in a new position and you're a new sure. department. So anything you want to say, pass on, I sure. will give you a pass on, but Josh Lance, yeah. Josh Lance wants to know, speak to busy work, okay. especially building projects, vehicle maintenance, etc. Yeah. You find yourself doing more station work than you do training. How do you approach the command staff and tell them the focus has shifted? Yeah. So that's one thing. And I go back to Chris Knudsen because I've learned from a lot of people, you know, all, right. all the officers that I had uh, throughout my career, whether good or bad, I've learned something from them. Uh, I take the good and, you know, I learned from the bad and I, I don't want to carry that forward. So one of the things that I was amazed with him at is he was hired as the training officer and, you know, the, the chief of the department, uh, you know, it was a new department that, you know, we were just becoming paid and all this stuff. And he would break into a training session. And I literally watched there one time, Chris told him, he was like, Hey, you hired me to be the train officer. We're in here doing training. I'll get with you after we're done here. Right. So, you know, when it, when it comes to busy work, listen, Lance, uh, so he's Josh. I love this dude. He works for UC. I love him very much. He's an awesome person. Um, the first thing I would say is we got 48 hours. Some of this busy work is important. Vehicle maintenance is important. You know, washing trucks is important. It's important to, to ha put on that facade that we have a clean truck. It's important that you, you know, hold yourself up to a standard the way that you wear your uniform, you know, shine those boots, take care of yourself. Uh, you know, it's important training can wait, uh, because we're there for 48 hours. You know, we, we can train at night when them, when those admin chiefs leave, go get it done. You know, we're, we're there. So eat dinner, chill out, hang out together and then go put some training in, uh, for the extra busy work. Be honest, man. Talk to, talk to your company officer. Talk. I mean, involve the, involve the administrative chiefs if, if we're having problems with them and, and talk to them because I feel like it's sometimes they don't understand, you know, you're putting all this stuff on them, but 
it better be realistic that the fact that it's taking that much time to get stuff done. I, I feel like no. I, I, I've, I've been there. I understand it. I, I've heard a lot of, of other company officers when I was working for the other department say it, but I'm telling you, it really comes down to time management. Like if, if you set out, Hey, we're going to go deploy this line. First thing I've already got my gear on the truck. We're going to go deploy this line. <clears throat> I got my morning meeting and then I got to check emails and then we're going to watch the truck and then we're going to do all this other stuff. All right, now it's training time. Let's nice. Go. And it's just about just going. Like you got to be clicking. You got to just get it done. So, you know, I it, I feel like it just boils down to time management and then having those t- tough conversations when they need to be had. And I'll be a broken record, hundred percent every time, because I I would I know if Tom was my battalion chief, I wouldn't have to tell him what was important. But a hundred percent, if you have a battalion chief that thinks that vehicle maintenance is more important than training, it's because admin said vehicle maintenance set the expectation that that was more important than training. Mm-hmm. And he, and he's meeting the expectation 100%. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so it's all comes down to expectations. Yep. And, uh, so I'll be the broken record Amen. <laughs> <laughs> over and over expectation slash accountability. Amen. Uh, Daniel Rodriguez, I love this because you just moved to a new department that's growing rapidly. Daniel Rodriguez has said, how do you change a small town department mindset for a department with so much future potential? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the way I look at it, I mean, we're we're very uh, close in proximity to San Antonio, you know, one of the largest departments in the state of Texas. Uh, you know, to me, that's that the standard that the citizens set. It doesn't matter how large or how small your department is. I don't, I don't care. You know, they don't care. I'll tell you that I live, I live in the city that I serve now, you know? Uh, so to me, if, if I'm not at work, like I'm relying on Cibolo to respond to my house. And if my wife is incapacitated, my daughter is going to get pulled out. Like that's my expectation. So it, it really comes down to, uh, we have to take that mindset going forward. Uh, you know, again, I go back to the chief Mo Davis quote, uh, that, that we have to, everything that we do builds off that every expectation that we set forth, every training opportunity that we have, we are going to set it to that standard and we're going to just improve each other. And, you know, civil is just growing very quickly. So we have a lot of change to, to overcome. Uh, but, Again, I go back to we've got a lot of very young and they're hungry. So I feel like it's not even going to be that big of an issue. It's just a matter of going and putting in the work with them. Like, that's it. So, you know, and sweating right there alongside of them. Put in that sweat equity with them. You know, do it with them and and show them that you're capable. I'm not asking you to do anything that I'm not willing or capable to do. So, uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot lot to do. And I'm not I I don't have the blinders on that it's going to happen overnight. Right. But we are going to start making progress on day one. It's just, that's the way it's going to be. And what we'll do is in uh, July, 2023, we'll have battalion chief. If he hasn't promoted by that time, <laughs> battalion chief back on to see how it's working <laughs> and see what's changed. I mean, I'm not, yeah, I'm not even, not even as a challenge, like a hundred percent. Like I yeah. want to know how it goes. That's a great, that's a great point of accountability. It really is, man. Yeah, Cause I'm in. we get, we get the snapshot of like, right when you take over and then one year later, like you're, when you're like burnt out and like a cigar hanging, you're like, F it, <laughs> we're done. <laughs> but no, hundred percent. It, it, it'd be good. Uh, John Perry said, talk to us about your approach to teach the unteachable people. Love this question already. Yeah. The so, folks that think different from us and make training a bit harder. How do you get through to them? Yeah. So, <laughs> so John Perry it is a battalion chief of the department that I used to work at. And uh, okay. again, a really great friend of mine. Uh, we've hung out in the barn. Uh, he's the one that got me into cigars. I love him. Uh, nice. Yeah. So, and he's got some really damn good ones. So, um, but yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, the ones that are not willing to learn, uh, again, I go back to that, that quote that I like to use. And I, you're right. I feel like it needs to be a t-shirt. You can lead the horse to water. You can't make him drink. I, I feel like that's horse, horse crap. I'll drown them. Like, I'm going to put you in so many situations that we're just going to put in work continuously. And to a degree, it again, it sounds rough, but I feel like at times it, it's like a puppy, right? If you want to train a puppy, first things first, you get them tired out and then you start training them. So a lot of that mentality is, hey, we're going to go put in all this work and then eventually you're going to be so broken down that you have no choice but to listen. 
Like that's your only option at this point. Nice. Uh, I've had, I've had firemen that I've worked with that, that, you know, did not really want to be part of training, but what we did is we just inundated them with it. And that's not, that's not just me. Like it was my, the rest of my crew. We, we had that expectation. We're going to put in this work. And if you weren't meeting the standard, like if you weren't able to do these tasks, well, we're just going to do it repetitively until you can. Yeah, so, you can. Yeah, and, and and just don't like. I feel like you just don't give them give them the option. Don't. There is no option. You perform or you don't. That's it. Because that, that's what we have to do. And I, I man, okay, All right, <laughs> yes, great answer, Tom. I'm not going to expound. Uh, how do you manage family and work? This comes from Ryan Nasir. He said, "How do you manage family and work?" being so invested in the job while being able to spend time with family? Man, I would love to tell you that I had the answer to this. I would love to tell you. So this is my, this is my take on it. And uh, through the course of my career and, you know, all the trainings and, and now teaching uh, it, it's been even harder. Uh, I, I feel like there, we like to say balance. There's not a balance. It's not because it always defaults to the fact that we're going to win. So for instance, if, if I have a training coming up and then I schedule another one and then next month I've got two and, you know, I always win because I'm getting to go to the training. Like our, if you're hard charging in this field and you really want to get good at it, you are going to default to, I'm going to say, yes, I want to go to that training. If one comes up, you're going to say yes. So the best quote unquote balance that I've come up with is for having a family one, if, if, if my wife says no, I take it as a no. I'm not going to even ask. I'm not going to even dive off into that subject even more. Like It's just going to be a hard no. Uh, luckily for me, now that uh, we're at where we're at, we have a six-year-old daughter. And you know, I, I think now the no's have gotten less because when I am home, we are investing each other and really taking the time just to be together. So put the phone down, pay attention to her wash the dishes, fold the clothes, like be right there with her, go mow the lawn, take care of stuff when you're at home. And then those yeses become very plentiful mm. because she sees that you're invested and you're actually here and you're actually present. Yes. Uh, you know, but again, I go back to that, that there is no real balance. We're always going to win. So be cognizant of that and understand if you've got like two or three, you know, trainings coming up, the next one that comes up, if it's within that same month, just don't even ask and just take it as a no and don't even put it out there. Like it's not, it's not even worth it. Just, you have to find that balance within yourself to understand when it's time to not even ask, you've got to find it. So that that's the best answer that I can come up with. I've thought about it a lot and I, it's still something that I don't feel like I've got figured out a hundred percent, but where I'm at right now, I'm getting to do a lot of cool things and my wife is a hundred percent for it. The one thing that I will say is all all that I want out of all of this is at the end of the day for my daughter, eventually when she gets older and, and you know, all this stuff is taking time away from her. What I want her to eventually think when she's grown up is, man, dad was doing a good thing. He was doing it. You know, that, that's all I want. So uh, I, I feel like you just got to come with that mindset and just make sure that you're getting it right because it's important. Dude, that's a beautiful metric. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot say I, I had something I was going to say there about how this job will take away from your priorities, et cetera, et cetera. But that oh. is a beautiful metric, man. Yeah. Uh, if you get nothing else out of the scrap, then other than my daughter said, Hey, it was worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. All right. Uh, sorry. That wouldn't really hit uh, notes book or books that you yeah. think firefighters should be reading, man. I always like to ask this question. I'm currently, and I tell people all the time, I'm 59 books behind, even <laughs> though I try to read every day. Yeah. But I want to hear, what do you think? So I'm going to I'm gonna throw a curveball at you. So one thing, uh, The Road Less Traveled by M. Scott Peck. So I read it back when I was in college, and I've read it a couple times since. Uh, it talks a lot about delaying of gratification, and I feel like it makes a really good crossover to the fire service. Um, it, it's a stellar book. It, it, it does kind of dive off into the weeds a little bit, but if you just read the part about delaying of gratification, I feel like that plays over really well to the fire service. And the reason I say that is, uh, a lot of folks want to come in and they want to be, uh, you know, at the, at the top of the board, they want to, you know, but it takes a while. 
delay that gratification. Do the hard work now because it pays off in the long run. Right on. It's one thing that I found out, like, if you've got to do those shitty chores, like, do the bad ones first. Like, it's weird, but if you delay that gratification because the hard ones are done first and then you get to do the cool shit later, well, that's pretty fun because it works out really well. <laughs> no. Uh, another one, the report from Engine Company 82, man. Love it. Love Smith. It. God, oh, man. hell yeah. Do yourself a favor. Read it. I pass it around uh, at the department all the time. Uh, the one that I used to be at, I, I passed it around to my whole crew. Uh, I intend to do the same thing. So it's actually at the at the station right now. Uh, I'm going to pass it out and let people start reading it because it's a great book. Um, Extreme Ownership, Jocko. Uh, so I'm reading it right now. Uh, man, that dude's awesome. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I really like him. <laughs> it's part of him. Yeah. Uh, now I want to go back to Peck and. Uh, yes. Stoicism, just in general, is it is a very. Because I'm, I'm huge on stoicism. Yeah. Is, it, is it that? No, no, it's not. Okay. It's, uh, it's a little bit more frou-frou than the stoicism, but okay, okay. It, it is a good book. Nonetheless. I want, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it is. Uh, that's one thing that I've not dove off into, but I've heard it now from, you know, Aaron Fields. I know you've talked about it quite a bit. It's something that I definitely want to dive off into is that. that well, that delayed gratification is just a, such a huge part yeah. of the stoicism. You know what I'm saying? And and so when you, when you brought that up, I'm like, and again, it, this will be number 60 book on my list of 59, now 60, yeah. that I have to read. Um I love it, man. And when people bring up extreme ownership, everybody always asks me, number one question probably on books I get is, hey, if I'm just going to read one book, what will it be? And mm-hmm. I always say extreme ownership. Yeah. And I, I don't say it because it's the best. I really, I'm not, but if you're only going to read one, that's the one I would suggest you read <laughs> because the principles are, are just so easy to apply and it's just that uh, universal. Yeah. All right. Love it, brother. Love it. Okay. Here we go. We have a thing. I know you know what it is. Yes, sir. It's called the next five questions for firefighters. <laughs> it used to be the five questions for firefighters, but hundred percent. My deal is this. The audience gets to chip in and try and score the answers to these questions. The answers are hundred percent your opinion. I pass out the points. They're arbitrary, <laughs> but are Tom Hollick, are you ready for the next five questions for firefighters? I'm ready, chief. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you guys will chip in and say max points or eh. Okay, that's your, that's your options. Max points or eh. All right. Number one, what single characteristic makes the difference between a run-of-the-mill firefighter and the top-tier go-to badass firefighter? Uh, I feel like it just boils down to persistence. Like, uh, never giving up. Uh, the, the willingness to do the hard work. Uh, a lot of people want to be that level, but a lot of people aren't willing to do the hard work. So you have to be willing to do the hard work in order to get there. You're never going to be that, that go-to. And that was as a fireman, as, as a driver, as a company officer, my intent was always, I wanted to be that go-to. My, my, my mentality coming into the battalion chief position, I want to be the go-to. Like that is what I want to be. There's not a better feeling in the world than you're sitting too deep in staging and your engine gets called in front of the next. Like that is a great feeling to be able to be that person. And yes. the beauty and the ugliness of it is it takes forever to get to that point. So you have to be persistent to get there. But the ugliness of it is you can lose it that fast. Nice. So it's up to you to be persistent, to make sure that you're always ready and willing and able to do that job. And, and I, I just feel like that's the, that's the biggest characteristic, man. Like you got to be persistent. You got to, Always be evolving. You just got to be ready to go, man. Always. There's about 14 people that said max points, so it's easy for me, <laughs> dude. 100%. And I don't, I don't remember who it was that said when you arrive to a fire and you're not first due and you're like fifth due or whatever. It, it was a busy job town type. I, I don't remember which scrap it was. He said, but you run up there with your ladder. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And they put you to work, and, and you nope. like, you like get inserted into it. So yeah, I wish I could to work. <laughs> I wish I could contribute that to who said it, but dude, I love that man, 100. Uh, percent Irregardless of, yeah, dag. Kevin Fluger said daggum points. <laughs> that might be a new thing. All right, number two. If you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice as a rookie, yeah. what would it be? Uh, honestly, I, I would just say for me specifically, it would just be stay the course, like just stay the course, just be, just be where you're at, be, be comfortable being where you're at. Uh, honestly, I, I don't regret anything in my career and that includes the mistakes that I've made. 
So the mistakes and, and everything that I've been able to be part of have led me to where I'm at right now. Uh, so back when I first started, I would just say, man, uh, initially I was like, is this really what I needed to do is, you know, I've been through those ups and downs in the career of like, Oh, I need to find something else. Like I'm going to go be an office worker in a cubicle. And then you go to these trainings, you're like, screw that noise. Like, <laughs> this is the best job in the freaking world, man. What was yes. I thinking? So, uh, just stay in the course. Uh, I love where I'm at. Uh, I've met some amazing people. I've just had great opportunities. And had I not, had I not, uh, you know, done that, then I wouldn't have had these opportunities. So to me, it's just staying the course. And I, I feel like even now, like I tell myself that, like, just stay the course, be there, be present, be ready to go and, and just, just be with it. Yeah. 100%. You cannot yeah. not say the course. Number three, what is your favorite training drill and i feel like i know what it's going to be but i'm going to still throw it at you what's your favorite training drill yeah so i mean obviously it's going to be anything writ i mean that's what i'm, I'm, comfortable, I'm comfortable <laughs> okay. there i love that uh but again the big five though like anything with ground ladders like going and again like i go back to what jim mccormick said you know we use the the writ as a guys to, to tre- teach the basics so yes. really if i'm training ground ladders then i'm training for writ. you know i do like to dive off into the the packaging and, and the writ packs and throw some of those drills out there too. That, those are some of my favorite drills, but really because it's, it's physically intensive, it's physically exhausting. And it, it just puts you into a realm of, you've got to see what you're made of. So that's why I like those drills though, because it, it makes you work, you know? I love it, dude, man. Yeah. Max points, 100% on force, throw, stretch, flow, grab, drag, repeat. I that's love it when you quote Jim and when you say, it's just reinforcement of the basics. That's it. So 100%. <laughs> All right. Number four. What mistake have you learned the most from in your fire service career? Yeah. So I go back to that initially when I got on is being removed from the crew. You know, uh, I didn't understand that. And trust me when I say I do now and I have for a while, uh, but that's a mistake that I'm willing to own. Uh, I didn't understand it. So if you are that person and, and you're, you're removing yourself from the crew, don't. Cause you're losing, like you're the one that's losing out. If they're hanging out in the bay and you're not there, man, go out there and get with them. Go, go do it. Just sit, listen, uh, and, and just go be part of it because that's a mistake that I made that I wish that I had them because I feel like I missed out on some really cool times by doing that. You know, uh, luckily the, the captain that I had called me out on it pretty early. It, it was probably a, a year or so in, but he, he finally called me out and he was like, Hey man, you're missing out. And I was like, Oh, okay, cool. So then I, I, it didn't take long to figure out I was missing out because as soon as that happened, we were hanging out, we were going out and, you know, going to the bars and they come over to the house, pick me up, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, uh, but don't, don't miss out. It's, it's on you to, to not miss out. I love it. There we go. Matt McGee, smooth book cartel, Kyle Sanchez. They said max points, max smooth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They said, yeah, we, yeah, they hit it. All right. No. And, and, and this is what I wish more people just understood intuitively is that, when you take care of things at the firehouse, when you take care of things away from the firehouse, man, emergency scenes take care of themselves. Amen. I man, they do. That. Yep, you're right. So, uh, number five. I, this is my favorite question. This is why it still survives to this day. Yeah. Heavy fire. Searchable space. Would you rather be assigned to the nozzle or first in on VES? Yeah, I feel like a lot of folks that know me are probably going to be surprised by this answer, but I want the knob, man. I, oh really? I, I want the nozzle, dude. There's there's not a better feeling than you break through that threshold, you own that house, you put the fire out, you get to high five afterwards, and you kick the ass. Like there's not a better feeling in the world. And if you haven't had it, do do it sometime soon because it feels really good. It feels really good. I love that feeling. Uh, something I'll definitely miss being where I'm at now. Uh, I'm gonna miss it, but yeah, there there's not a better feeling in the world. You know, dude, a I'm thousand sure. percent. And, and, and I will placate it with this. I've never made a grab. I've never had the opportunity to. So I don't know. Maybe that's better feeling. But for me, I've, I've had the opportunity to put a fire out. So I do know what that feels like. And, and I, I, I'll, I'll say that for me, that that's where it's at. One hundred percent. Here's the deal. The the right answer is VES. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> but 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 I will say this is that I always listen to people why they say it, dude. Mm-hmm. And one thousand percent, man. Yeah. It's like backdraft. Like, see, I was doing it. 
<laughs> when you're doing it, you're doing it. So max yeah. points for oh, number yeah. five, brother. <laughs> there it is, and that officially makes this 149 scraps in the book, dude. We went for a while. Oh yeah. Tom Hollick, if someone wants to get a hold of you, how do they do so? Yeah, so hit me up on Facebook, uh, Tom Hollick. Uh, it's the younger-looking Tom Hollick. My dad's name is Tom Hollick, too, so it's the younger, better-looking one. That's the one you're looking for. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, reach out to me via Instant Messenger. I'm all about handing my phone number out. Uh, anything, like, I live by the fact that if you want to, if you're in the area or you're just passing through, like, you want to come train? You want me to come to you? Dude, I'm in. 100% I'm in. Uh yeah, so reach out to me that way. I'll get you my phone number. We'll get in contact. We'll make stuff happen. I love it. I love it. Okay, uh, for everybody else, Firehouse. this is my housekeeping time. Yep. Firehousevigilance.com. Uh, Go there. Support the scrap. Support Firehouse Vigilance. Um, if you want to be a part of the, the, the vigilantes, all the information is there. We, we have discussions every day. Um, we're going to have another forum on the 31st. That's where we're going to discuss the electric vehicle fires. We're going to talk about uh, no-nonsense leadership from Jared Sergi. So if you want to be a part of that, go join it. Um, it's on firehousevigilance.com. Support the scrap, and you will get an invite to the vigilantes. Uh, what do I got? This was number 149. That means number 150 is next. 150 is a big deal. Like oh, yeah. 50 was a big deal. 100 was a big deal. 150 is a big deal. So, of course, Kurt Isaacson is going to go live from the dock for 150. And we're going to... Uh, let I, I'm basically going to sit there and just listen to Kurt talk. <laughs> Let's be honest about what's going to happen. And uh, I'm very excited about it. But check out August because Kurt's going to close out. Uh, actually, I, I haven't had a uh, actually a quick scheduling thing. I've got Isaacson doing 150. And then like a few days later, Frank Viscuso is going to come on and we're going to talk about his new book that just came out, Flashpoint. So I'm super excited about that. But check out August. It's Rick George on August 1st. Kyle Romagus doing his third appearance on the scrap and we're going to, it's going to be fun. And then Mark Von Oppen followed by Bill Gustin followed by Devin Craig. And so can you have anything better for an August in 2022? So anyway, uh, that's what's coming up. What else I got to announce? That's pretty much it. My brother, Tom Hollick. Yes, sir. Anything you got to add? No, nah, man. That's a, oh. that's a crazy lineup, man. That's gonna I'm be excited. Yeah. I'm super excited. Brother, yeah. thank you for giving me your evening. Thank you for giving me your insight. I'm, I'm really super excited about one year from now bringing you in and say, hey, let's compare notes. Yeah, I'm in. All right. For everybody else, the absolute scraps value comes from how much you guys throw at us and the value you guys bring. I appreciate you. I can never say it enough. Mutts, do not scrap. I hope... The tone stays silent unless it is burning. Everybody stay safe out there.